Good evening. Thank you for your attendance. I think you all know, and maybe some of you may share the premise of these discussions, which is essentially um, if you venture into SciArc and you have opportunities to pontificate, can you hear me? And you have opportunities to pontificate as you direct students uh, hither and yon. The hypothesis is that you have to take your turn on the other end. So uh, since Kipnis has done his share of pontificating, uh, we gave him an opportunity to make whatever the hell he made down there. <laughs> and uh, we'll take a few minutes to discuss it. So thank you for your effort. I was just reading the, the opening in the text that uh, Jeff prepared, and it designates him as a curator, and then it, and then it identifies a designer, which I think is, is unique to the uh, exhibition process at SciArc, uh, because typically the architect we invite is one and the same, meaning curator, uh, curator and designer. And the question, I guess the first question has to do with what that curatorial role might mean and whether in dividing the designer from the curator that we were segregating form from content, that sort of thing. So why don't you tell us what it means to be a curator? Yes, thank you for asking that. You're welcome. Um, okay, it's two things. One is, I was utterly thrilled when I got asked to do the show, to be in the, the gallery, and then it occurred to me that uh, in all the years I've seen the work in there, only the, the people that were in there were expert at what they did. And I, you know, they were architects and they did architecture. And that I wanted to make sure that I was going to be in the gallery as an expert at what I do. And I, meaning, I consider myself a professional show uh, producer, but not an architect. And uh, you consider yourself a professional show producer. Yes. Yeah. The other thing I want to say is the one mistake I made this entire show is to use the, the word curator again. Uh, I worked at the Wexner Center as a curator for a while. I curated shows at other places. But this is actually not an exhibition. Um, this is a show, and so I really wish I had used the word producer, because I feel like I produced and I wrote and produced this, and uh, Stephen was essentially the equivalent of the director or the art director. Um, so I wanted to make sure that everything I had to do with it, I was doing it not as a dilettante or as a uh, an amateur, and so I thought it was really important to me to do that. Now, the, the other project, the project that preceded this, the one in the hallway, um, I had much more, the same uh, group of people, or, uh, Steve was involved and Jose Ubery were involved, but I had much more hand in that show. I sort of uh, wrote and directed that show with, so I was much more involved in that show. This show, I, I didn't. I, ha I sort of conceived the relationships and suggested various ideas and then I turned it over to Steve and then Steve worked with an incredible team and they put it together. The, and then I did something I like to do in all of my shows and that is start to put in other practices, painting and uh, dolls that would start to activate the uh, inter um, disciplinary relationships that I'm always so interested in and find those kinds of surprises. So. I knew I was really good at that. That's what I'm good at, I think, and uh, and then I and then I could pull it off, and it worked really well. And so that's how it happened. You're convinced. I, I think the question yeah. was a little bit different. It, the question has to do with how you divide those two roles. 
that usually belong, in, in, in terms of what's been done in this gallery, belong to a single architect. Yeah, but see, I don't think any single architect has ever been interested in producing the kinds of, uh, the, in other words, I don't think an architect that puts their work in the show, in, work in the exhibition, they're, they're doing an exhibition, which is more like a documentary of their work. They're not producing a show, so they're not casting works of architecture and art into a, a stage play. So for me, that is something really different. So I don't think, I think a show is really different than an exhibition, and I think the history of the gallery is a history primarily of exhibitions. Um, for example, even the Lev Wood Show, which I know you and Hernan curated and ex installed, that was an exhibition. It, it had the status of something like a documentary about Lev Woods' work, and it tried to present it in a document. This is really about casting works of architecture uh, into roles that, it would pr that they would also work with paintings and other work, and, and to try to produce a whole different range of effects that belong both to architecture and to, or to each discipline in its own right, but also to the general cultural milieu so, and I don't think that happens in the gallery very often, which is what my goal was. Now whether, it, I believe it happens at least a little bit in there, and I think it's quite different for the gallery, and that's what I wanted to do. Well, let me go back to the, the reference uh, to Leb, and I think what I'm looking for is something, and I think every exhibition, that was unusual, because yes, he's was, yes. no longer and with I, us. Yes, right. So he didn't make it. Yes. He has made things for Cyark. We made it for him, right. I as, which, is, which is a different proposition. But he gave us a particular proposition, mean, meaning it wasn't pick one of these. Mm -hmm. In other words, it, it seems to me what, what you've given us is, you know, Sherlock Holmes mm -hmm. and Don Quixote. Mm -hmm and Robin Hood, no and people like that. I don't that. know Soren in. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a picaresque yes. venue, which means the characters stay the same and the story changes. Yes. And the question is, isn't that what you gave us? Yes. A picaresque yes. event. Yes. And you don't tell us where to go. You don't give us a chronology. You don't tell us what in what sequence to go where. Yes, there's a big, yes. So there's a kind of egalitarianism about it, and, and which would be very different, let's say, than what Leb would do to Yeah, but for me, I, I, that's a fantastic question. Um, in my thinking about uh, the specific qualities of each kind of material practice, uh, duration, temporality is, is unique to that. And the thing I like best about shows is, particularly art shows or uh, the kind, what I'm calling a show, is that there is no beginning, no end, no clear sense of how you, what, what you see first, what you see second, how you understand it. Not only that, you don't know if you're in the gallery, if you're part of the show, or if you are on display or looking at something on display. So the ephemerality of it and the, and the, um, fragility of which, like the difference between a picaresque novel is it has a beginning, has an end, and it proceeds in a definite order, even if you read it in a different order. So for me, it's very important for me that there's no place to start, place to end. It's why, for example, the curator's essay or the, the exhibition, uh, the producer's essay, I thought to myself, you know, people go to a show, they buy a catalog, then they read the essay the next day. So I'm not gonna start posting my essay, which is a series of interviews until tomorrow, so there'll be one month of uh, posts by me of, in, me of me interviewing viewing myself in other people's names, um, <laughs> like a guy named Sphagnum. Um, but let me let me get to uh, uh, another aspect of that of that discussion, which is this: if if you make something. And I think there are people here who share in this. If you make something and you look at it and you come to understand it in the process of developing it, I've always felt that, that you, the maker, understood what the final project is or the final result in a very different way 
than someone who comes in to see it off the street. That's true. So to make it is, is conceptually different and understood differently. Uh, and if you don't do that, in other words, if you split well, but, that. But can I ask well, you? Well, let you, me, so, yeah, so no, you don't get to ask. I don't get to ask. <laughs> but, but if you. Would you quit laughing at him? If you. <laughs> the Mater D has <laughs> spoken. <laughs> um, but the, the understanding that comes with making it um, is different, as I said, from mm -hmm. coming to look at it. So the question is, what can you tell us about the process of developing it that we won't know as a consequence of simply walking through it? What do you know about it that we don't know? Everything. Um. Well, then a lot's missing out of the show. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I, I certainly, first of all, I made the show. Um, Steve made the architecture. No, he, Steve was the chief architect, and, other, and John and, and uh, Ryan and Paul made works of architecture, and Fabian and... Uh, um, Maurice made paintings and Beverly made dolls and each of them knows exactly what they made and why they made it but I made the show and the show is you know and I cast it so I but it's not my job to make a show or write a poem or, or uh, write music and then go around explaining to everybody what they're supposed to be listening to um, in fact, it's my job. Well, I understand that. So if you want to say the show stands on its own, no. that's okay. I'm asking you something a little bit no, different. No, but it doesn't stand on its own. If it own. didn't, right. then what can you tell us as a consequence of the process of putting it together that we wouldn't know? Now, I mean, for instance, if I went in there and moved the pieces around, yes, you took the three it. models and took the one on the north and put yeah, it on you'd the... You'd ruin you, it. You care was, about that? Yeah. And I, you, but I'll tell you why I If I moved it two centimeters... Yeah, that, you'd ruin it. But I'll couldn't tell you. do it. Well, I can tell you why for two reasons. Uh, Steve made a discovery, and I think I told you this before, it, totally not outside of the show production, that the proportions of that gallery are identical to Rio Anji, uh, the Rio Anji Garden. And so everything in there is situated exactly where it is according to the way the rocks are situated in Rio Anji ga Garden for no reason whatsoever, period. Absolutely no. It's just became a ridiculous obsession of us. But if you move it two inches, you ruin it because then, uh, then it's not Rio Anji Garden anymore. I mean, it's just so dumb. I don't know. But, but then, so the pieces are obligated to some a priori yeah. model that only you know. Yeah, but, but in the end, that's not truly, in my mind, part of the show, but it is part of the rigorous production, and we cared about it. Um, so much so that at one point, two-thirds of the didactics were about Rio Anji Garden, or at least it seemed that way to me. But okay. for example, I care about uh, points of view. I care about the door. Like for example, Fabian's relationship to the door in the gallery. The painting of The Fabian. one in the far yeah. corner. Yeah. Uh, which is called Mirror um, and is based on the painting, it's actually based on Ivan Albright's painting from the film, uh, The Portrait of Dorian Gray, uh, through Bacon. But I've put it next to the door, so it reflects the door in the same way that the mirror on the opposite corner in Maurice's painting works that. And the way you see the points of view are produced. You know, so I've worked on the... the okay. You know, so, yes. So, so you're telling us that, that it's not what you see, it's the story that what you see sits on. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, that's And right. if you don't know that story, then you're missing a substantive piece of yeah. it. Yeah, and what I want to do is let you... In other words, you couldn't, as, as is often said with students, who walk up, put up their stuff, go to the beach, and you guys figure it out. Yeah. It's no, not I, like that. No, no. And I will slowly... I mean, we put a lot of hints in there. It's not tricks and hints, but we put a lot of ways to think about it in there. So, for example, you'll see a lot of the figural... Uh, sculpture, sculptural, as figural aspects of the architecture, and then one of Beverly's dolls is presenting it almost like a, a Broadway play presenter, 
And, and there's an uncanny relationship between the formal relationships of the figures of her doll and the, and the architecture that was, you know, so those are hints. And, but, and then if you look, so it, there's various ways if you look in close detail. So you'll see in each of the boxes, each of the boxes is a kind of hint of a way of an instruction to look at the work. Also, the show is planned to work entirely differently uh, from the balcony than from the door. So we spent a lot of time on what it was to walk in from the door and to see it from the balcony. And then by serendipity, when we put the, the Biennale gallery, the Biennale model on the outside, according to, because we were following your rules that nothing that's been seen before could be inside the gallery, it was fantastic because it, it turns out- You don't out have the, any rules. Yeah, you don't, <laughs> you don't have any rule. Yeah, that's a. That, that but you have this way, so very strong Inferno model. <laughs> yeah. the Dante model. Yeah. The, and so when you see that, from you the, mixed up heaven and hell. I think. Uh, that's what Peter said too. <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> Peter kept saying, "Why am I always hell?" And I said, "Well, you know, <laughs> go ask around." <laughs> um. Uh, let me get to <clears throat> let me get to another point. I, it, reading your um, uh, your text, your introductory text, you made a you made a reference to this uh, quote uh, architecture uh, architecture or or revolution, <laughs> and uh, I can go through this in two seconds. But the, the the first one on the left comes out of Hadrian's Villa, as Roman tragedy and comedy, and then Janus, which is movement and beginning mm -hmm. and end, and then the third one probably requires no explanation, and then yeah, then we come to the fourth one. And then my history, actually. That's right. <laughs> but uh, maybe you can tell us uh, how you could make such an erroneous statement as? that that's <laughs> the most important thing anybody ever said for 100 years or whatever you said. You architecture mean, revolution. Archi uh, architecture or, or revolution? I don't think I said for 100 years. I think I said in the entire history of architecture. Um, so please don't misquote me. Um, I was trying to help you a little, but obviously you don't want any help. It's a, it's a statement that says architecture doesn't simply work at the level of, so the, of the li social lives. It works at a deeply, profoundly level of political lives. And it says it aggressively, and it makes a choice. You get to make a choice. And so it's a polemic de declaration of a profound order that we've been trying to work out since the uh, time, since two, uh, 1940. We've been trying to, so which one, in, in your exhibition, which one did you choose? Which one what? Well, you, there are two options. Is architecture or revolution? Uh, I'm Would choosing you pick? architecture because I think architecture contests, architecture succeeds best at um, oh, well, ameliorating the possibilities of revolution the more it contests the status of the ground and the instantiated powers that control the ground. I think, I think what it means, uh, what, it, what it might mean is that either architecture deals with the issues of social history, which is probably a little bit presumptuous as an aspiration, but if that's the aspiration, either architecture manages those issues of history or if it doesn't, revolution will turn it over and will start again. And I guess the, the question, I, I, that's what it means to me. And uh, the question is whether it isn't possible for the two to coincide rather than for the two to be exclusionary. And I think I, I, I looked at this in the text, wait, and wait, just, just to finish. Explain that. Explain that. Wait I mean, a minute. What, what hang, on, hang on. Hang on. Hang um, on. Why is some green and some red? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Let's not trivialize this any further. <laughs> um, and and at the end of at the end of your piece, I mean, see, I understand the polemic of architecture and revolution and whatever, whatever dire portents 
are contained in that admonition. And then at the end of Kipnis' text, it says, the architecturalists make it up. So architecture revolution, and then the author of the show says the, architect, uh, the architecturalists make it up. And I was trying to understand how those two discourses might have something to do with one another. Um, I, yeah, but you're, you're uncannily on target tonight. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Who says you know? Just answer the question. <laughs> well, in my experience, I, 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 that's what I feel. It, it, I think, for example, making it up or fiction, if for, when you walk up a staircase and it's a big staircase and you walk through a giant door um, and you are either belittled or minimalized by the architecture in the face of the power that you're about to, whether it's a courthouse or a church, um, of course, that's the world of the extrovert, meaning the building makes you what you are, as opposed to well, the alternative. Well, that that's the goal of the architecture, and it's certainly the goal of the client for that building. The goal of the architect is to obligate the yes. guy who's walking up the stairs. Yes, I think so. so that's but it wasn't at the point that your show did precisely the opposite? Yes. That it didn't obligate yes. anybody to do anything? Right, but the other issue is if, if you can let people know that these are not really uh, acts of real, re realism, but they are acts of storytelling, then you relieve, you relieve or you, uh, you ameliorate, how would you say, uh, you undermine the power of the architect of the architecture to act in that, in that way. I mean, it's what Bataille said is that when you walk into a church and you are uh, reverent in the presence of God because of the architecture, you're actually subservient to the priest. And we all know the consequence okay. of that. Well, I mean, that, not okay, I get to finish this one. You finished. No, no, no. <laughs> you just it, don't know. Uh, well, let me put it, I, I'm gonna get to finish no, it go well. Ahead. Uh, and I, I'm moved by that argument. I'm moved by the fact that both of them, but the thing is, I also like the fact that architecture can produce reverence. You know, I mean, that was the argument that was used. No, no, but that's, say, right, I understand that. And I, I, so let's say we stipulate to that. What I'm trying to, to, to square or to correlate is the statement about architecture and revolution, which I think presumes that there are empirical, social, and political circumstances which have to be addressed and might be addressed and ameliorated or solved by architecture. Well, or, that's not, I think wait, 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 wait. thought that. Or, or there's, well, right. Yeah, so but I'm I don't trying to understand. Yeah, well, I, I don't in other words, it mean, it's important because it means something you say it means as opposed to what he says it means. Yeah. Because the idea of making it up, which means there aren't substantive, social, and political, empirical conditions mm -hmm. which architecture has to address, but you get to say what those conditions are yes. and then say how they're addressed. Yes, exactly. A little bit different. Yes, right. yes, exactly. So I you're one's contradicting the other. No, 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 Korb, I believe, was naive. He, he would constantly vacillate between a poetic description of architecture's effects and an instrumental social description. He would say, on the one hand, archi archi only architecture can solve the, uh, only architecture and urbanism can solve the Ill ills of society today. You know this from Bill Bradyus. And then the next time he would say, you know, architecture is the poetic play of light, and, uh, you know, et cetera. He, he wasn't sure where to place his faith in architectural effects. And so he, he had a night, he was caught in what, uh, what I would call an aporia. Okay, but let me ask you this. When, when you say he's naive and he's listening to you and he responds, he's not naive, you're a cynic. Uh, he and just, the, 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 he's a not only naive, he's a dead person who's saying wrong things about me. Well. That's not much of an answer, <laughs> because when, when, you, when you attribute a kind of, kind of, and the times are quite different. Yes. And the question is, 
do you belong to your time in the say, same way he belonged to his time? Because he certainly wasn't alone. I mean, he may have been solitary in some ways, but in, in a conviction which you read backwards, and it's probably easier to read history, although whether it's any more legible is an argument, but you read backward as an innocent or as a naive character, but coming from where he was coming from yep. with the, hypos uh, the hypothesis yes. that architecture has the capacity and the prowess and the momentum yes. and all of that to go remake the Soviet Union yes. and things like that. And, and looking at it as somebody who looks back over the sort of desert of histories, all of that, because you said that was an issue not only for the last hundred years, but for the last thousands yes. of years. And yet you're saying at the same time it's naive. I mean, I think that kind of conviction, let me show you what I mean. How did you put that picture of me together, by the way? It's very simple. Yeah, you, you tell someone in your office to do it, just like I do. <laughs> I directed it. <laughs> um, Glad to see you learning. I directed it and, because I knew the... Con <laughs> I forget almost as fast as I learn. Uh, so, uh, Santa Lea, which is... And then we just do the last hundred years in right. ten seconds or less, but Santa Lea as an name. aspiration, but not quite realizable. Right. And Ron Heron, in, in terms of technique, it, we can not only do it, we can make it kinetic. And I think this is the third one, is an advertisement for a movie called Airplane. Um, <laughs> and which, which, we, which we dug the, the up. The last one is fantastic. But uh, yeah, come on. The, the, and, and what you're looking at is our conceptual models that, be, that belong to particular people at particular points in time. So the, the last one we get to in a moment, but the airplane, it seems to me, I mean, what, what you're losing, what you're losing, and I don't think you can teach it, I'm not sure where you find it, what you're losing is the wonder of things. And, and there is, I mean, it's certainly in Santalia, maybe a little bit less in, in the archigram stuff. By the time you get to an airplane and you can, you got this big hunk of metal and you can fly a gazillion miles and, you know, Icarus and Daedalus and all of that, and now we can do it, but it's not enough anymore. Mm -hmm. So you have to bend it and twist it and curve it and see if we can make it do something. And that's what I mean. If cynical is not the word, it's that, that what is, I think for some people, intrinsically amazing about the capacity to span the river or fly the oceans, those kinds of things, or build a tower to the sky. You forgot about the sky. Oh, you're always talking about the ground. No, no. By the way, but I didn't. Hang, hang no, on I did not get off into that. Oh, no, no, we're, no, we're coming no, no. back to it. I, <laughs> wait a minute. How many people have you heard? How well, many of you out there have heard me lecture about why we don't talk about the sky? Anymore? This is. It doesn't matter. This is yes, not a so gallop poll. I forgot pole. about a damn thing. <laughs> Let's I just deal. why we don't care about the sky anymore. Well, you'll have to relearn that. But let's let's stick to the airplane because I think I think um, uh, not not to make this silly. I don't want to make it silly, but I think I think the point of the of the advertisement is illustrative of what has happened over a long period of time, at least in, in, in a certain context, to the optimism, what you call the naive quality, which I would call wonder, which for sure belongs to little kids, although probably less and less. Um, so uh, the question is, isn't that symptomatic of the attitude where we are now, that we're on number three. We've conceded that number one and two are implausible. And the anthropomorphic piece on the end is closer to three, and it's discarded one and two. Well, I certainly don't think that's right. I think uh, it's discarded the... Um, naivetes of one and two in the sense it, in order to put a building into motion in relationship to a ground it doesn't actually have to move for example um, 
The cantilevers in number four are all nonlinear complex cantilevers that are um, almost impossible to calculate and were impossible to calculate uh, until um, uh, finite element analysis. And so, and yet they, so. But for, and that's important yes, because. It's, it's super important because to figure out, these, these are not anthropomorphic at all. These are not about bodies. These are about figurality. They are strictly architectural. So all of the, the fact that those cantilevers are operating the way they do to produce a kind of relaxed, dance-like, uh, codependency, uh, uh, torpor, um, all have to do with the fact that they were, they just have recently become technically possible. Well, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. How close is it to falling down? Uh, I mean, did you test it? I mean, it's interesting, and I, I, I was have, just looking at, well, hang on a second, have, well, hang, hang on, hang, let me just get it out, and then close. you can, well, then you haven't pushed it as, as perhaps you're claiming. I mean, one of the interesting things about the gallery, and I can think of a couple, including uh, Greg's, that actually fell down, and that was not necessarily considered pejorative. No, wait a minute, because what, what people have tried to do or aspire to do in making various pieces is to test them and test the capacity to build in a number of ways. And if you do that and it doesn't quite work, then what that suggests is that you don't quite know, which is okay, then, then we're in the process of learning. So if you say this was incalculable until today, but isn't that true of Brunelleschi's dome? Isn't that true of Durham Cathedral? I mean, there are a whole series of things that have been built historically that weren't calculated. So the fact that it can be calculated or not in and of itself doesn't give it, in a qualitative sense, an importance to architecture. Well, you keep trying to put me in the role of the architect. Um, and I'm interested in the architecture, and we wanted to make sure that the issues of the architecture address significant issues of architecture in the ar architecture, like structural issues and the status. Of, I, I don't like cantilevers. I think cantilevers is a legacy of a kind of macho performance. Uh, and it has for me, uh, at the very least, uh, a negative connotation or discredited connotation. You mean it's macho if you were to do it today, or it was macho when Niemeyer did a library in no, Brazil at it, it was born Niemeyer. as a wonder. I think yeah. it was born in wonder. It, it, it then became um, a, a, a sort of, my, you know, I, like I, as much as I love Wolf, Wolf's desire to have the longest, the world's longest uh, 90 degree cantilever is just not interesting to me. Um, however, cantilevers that perform, that are very complex in their performance that produce a new kind of effect that are not about the, the power of man over materiality because it makes it look like it's resisting gravity, that's really interesting to me. And so for, I, can make, I can make the figures, or we can now make the figures uh, in architecture stand still and yet be far more mobile than Ron was able to do with walking cities plus produce a kind of contextual set of familial relationships that are not particularly relation, related to locality anymore. So, and I, for example, when you walk into that gallery and if you look at the really tall uh, stacked piece, it will look to a certain age group in this audience like something like figural brutalism. To another age group, it'll look like just like world of mind craft. You know, so I said, uh, you know, so if you're 14 year old and you play World of Minecraft, you're going to walk in and say, "Oh, a Minecraft building or whatever, a voxel building." Um, so the, I think those are really important issues. So how do you, how do we take the cliches of architecture, remobilize them to new audiences, to new existential niches, to take the power that we have over? Uh, matter in architectural relationships and, and set them to find new projects. And I think that, oh, okay. that's what we're so, to do. So what is a new existential, I mean, we, um, the, 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 the issue of, and I think, I think you said this, uh, 
Jeff, in your, in your written piece, something about tragedy yes. that, that and, and the first one is, is tragedy and comedy. Yep. And that I think the implication is architecture has been tragedy for too long, and it needs to include comedy. It, needs, it, it has always what, had jokes. There's a big difference between architecture. There's lots and lots of jokes. Well, let me let me just finish because I'm trying to understand what you mean. If okay. if architecture, the question is, is a few questions. The question is, is is there something intrinsic or endemic to architecture that makes it tragedy? Period. That's its nature. Well, there and, are. Uh, hang on, and and or if if it let me just get to the end of it, or if it if it isn't or if it shouldn't be, which might be the proposition, if it should be something else, yeah. and the something else should be comedy. And then I think we have to explain what the tragedy means defined in terms of architecture and what the comedy, because you're not talking about Seinfeld. You're not, no. you're not talking about King Lear's no. fool no. or something. So, I mean, it, I, I don't think saying architecture and tragedy and seeing architecture and comedy are self-explanatory. We have too much of one, we need more that needs to be. That's right. So you'll have to read the. No, I'm asking you to explain that distinction. No, no. I've withheld that. I've, I introduced the idea and as I unfold the curatorial essay, that's going to be one of the most important things. It's the discussion about what is it, what one means about comedy as a specific quality in any, like what does it mean to speak about comedy and music? So for example, when Mozart, Mozart's greatest opera uh, is Marriage of Figaro. And many people consider it one of the great cultural achievements of all time. It's its most political opera. It was banned from Vienna because its theme was to t challenge the court. He erased all the politics and used uh, comic techniques, and immediately after it wrote Don Giovanni, his most famous tragic opera. And the success of the both of those, the, the, the possibility of both of those in the apparatus of music makes music a, a fully fleshed out um, medium of cultural expression. And that's true in painting. I mean, look at Rauschenberg. Yeah, Rauschenberg but you're, but you're Rauschenberg, talking about everything what, but what, we're ta what I'm asking you about. I'm trying to associate that with architecture. I know what you're trying to do, but I'm going to answer the question. Well, we'll find out. I'm going to try to answer the question, <laughs> but at the very least, I'm going to get to a period. You've had many of the period. Let's go. Um, I think it's, I, I, there is a lot of writing on architecture the, by philosophers and in architecture that it is an intrinsically tragic uh, medium. Meaning what? You'll get to read that. So the answer, the answer to the question is no comment. The answer is no. Read the blog. We're read having, we're having a discussion here. Don't send me off to read something. I can read that later. Uh, I mean, I think it's uh, and uh, okay. Rectitude, permanence. Um, the the qualities that we most venerate in architecture are qualities that we oftentimes, more often than not, associate with tragedy. Like, for example, uh, permanence or timelessness. Those are death. That is, that's associated with death. So the difference between a tragedy and comedy in Aristotle is if the hero it lives or dies. And if he lives or she lives, it's a comedy. And if he dies or she dies, it's a tragedy. And so anyone who believes that the uh, value of architectures are firmitas, economitas, and the other toss. Uh, are, those are, well, you will trace those to the tradition of tragedy, in Birth of Tragedy, for example, by Nietzsche. Now, Nietzsche's response to Birth of Tragedy was the gay science. That's his book on comedy. And he is very clear to go through all the disciplines about to talk about where, but he never mentions architecture. And so I, I think it's interesting that architecture, and I think these, this is true, has been true for three reasons. It's 
architecture has been virtually immobile for most of its history simply because we never had much power over matter. It's that's, it, you know, it was really hard to build stuff and we couldn't do that much with it but stick ornaments on it. Uh, let, me, let me try it a different way. I, I, think, you're, I think you're talking about it, it, it as, as a generic subject from the point of view of an outsider as opposed to somebody who does it. You're damn right. And who does it and, and who would see it. I mean, the, the, issue, of <clears throat> the issue of life and death which may have to do with the durability of the building, but the death of the author, yes. which, is, which, is, which is a different proposition, so that you're stretching yourself, if you, if you subscribe to this, by making something that is, is substantially more durable than you are. So the ephemeral character, who, whoever made Angkor Wat, which is sitting there with trees growing out of the roof 1,500 years later, so that the human condition to make things, to have those things endure, to have them evolve and ultimately be misunderstood, assuming they were initially understood, and the characters who, who did those have long disappeared. And the question is, is that intrinsically, that's what I meant when I said, well, is the, is, 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 hang on, is the con, I have to get to a period, is, is, is in a lot of commas, is, is, is the, <laughs> the context in which that's done intrinsically tragic. What I just said, if that's what it is, then to say it has to be comedic misses the point. Well, you might be, I mean, for one thing, mine is a conjecture. You know, if you have a history some thousands of years long that has lent itself uh, or biased itself towards one side, and you had any sense whatsoever, you would say that the intelligence is teaching you that that's the way it is. You know, that's not a mistake. You have to make some arguments about why things are like that and how things might be differently now. But for example, when I walk outside uh, in any city, and this is a vast generalization, I understand it, but what I see is a picture of youth and rectitude. I see buildings that stand vertical and that stay more or less um, dedicated to uh, youthfulness. I don't see buildings that are half drunk, leaning on each other with vomit under them. You know, but right this second in my life, that's kind of how I feel. I sort of feel like I don't, my, I hurt, I don't, you know, I, I lean on stuff, I feel, you know, I, I feel entitled to an architectural sensibility that acknowledges my value in the world, which means I, I am sensitive to the fact that, the, that rectitude, forget I'm, I'm moving from permanence to rectitude, <laughs> is being absolutely forced down my throat every time I look outside, every time I walk around, and I would like not to replace it, not to fight it, but to add to the palette of it uh, the possibility of an existential niche that allows for my sense of my being in the world to be um, celebrated in architecture. You know, it's, it's, it's way, funny. Everybody's I'm, now, I, I got huh? this guy, right? I don't know what you're... <laughs> I like it when um, people are doing like this. The, the <laughs> I'm teasing you. Come on. What? I'm just teasing you. Him? Because I think what you're saying is right. It is likely I'm wrong. You know, it, I'm not saying. It's not I so mean, much likely, all, likely that you're wrong. Most of my life wrong. I've discovered that that turns out to be true. But it's the conjecture I'm working on and we're using the exhibition to work on. Which is why you said let's let's make it up. I wasn't necessarily talking about the the visceral experience of walking out the door and wandering around the city, mm -hmm. which is a different proposition. Yes. Again, yes. that's the outsider's pro proposition. What I'm talking about are, have to do with the issues of actually making these things as an individual yeah, but who I makes make things. things. Yeah, but hang on. But but you're you're telling us about what architecture needs. And it's missing a quality, and you yeah. want to introduce yeah. that but quality. For example, when I wait, wait a second. So uh, what I'm saying to you is, you may be introducing something that's not intrinsic and doesn't belong. And when you introduce it, you may get number three on the right. When I uh, commented on your work and your lecture, and I did the giraffe, the little baby. Was babies. that the Hugo Chavez? 
but mm -hmm. that was funny too. But uh, when I <laughs> when I showed the new, so you don't get comedy doesn't mean you get to tell the audience when they laugh. There's a there's a whole lot of difference between comedy and jokes, um, <laughs> as you clearly know. Um, when I showed the newborn giraffe and I showed your column, I was showing that because I thought that was one of the most profound achievements in a local tactical sense of a moment of architectural comedy. You know, that was, you know, uh, the little giraffe that couldn't walk and your bent kneed, awkwardly standing um, tower, which is, by the way, set in opposition to a tower of straightforward rectitude. So the, the A, B, the two towers uh, are absolutely a tragedy and comedy image in my mind, and that was the point I was trying to make in that moment. And actually, I think maybe the Hugo Chavez thing didn't work, uh, but I, or, or if you forgot Caesar that, Chavez, maybe. But what was the guy's, the, the, the ex vice president that I was comparing you to, that I think that made you even madder. Uh, no, uh, Cheney? No, no, the, the, <laughs> no, the dumb one. Oh, Gerald Ford. No, guy, even dumber. The guy that played football without a helmet. No, the guy, the guy who said, I mean, next I'd time I go to Latin America, I better brush up on my Latin. Dan Quayle, there you go. Oh. <laughs> it was just one of those nights I was uh, off on my jokes, but pretty good on my comedy. But I think, see, I think those are, that was a, you know, so I don't know anybody. Well, That's me, why you're in the show, by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, <okay. laughs> Uh, you know, it, you what, off, what I know, <laughs> um, it just shows an, it, as an act of desperation. I, 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 hey, I think. <laughs> those can really work for okay. you. Okay, <laughs> I, I think I think the the discussion the discussion of awkward, and I think this this came up when I said that from time to time exhibits in the gallery fall down when they do what you advocated but didn't do with this walking city which you right. say is not a walking city with cantilevers that, that, that don't work. So awkward may simply have to do with something which is not understood and in the process as opposed to rerunning what is already understood. Yes. And what's symptomatic of being clumsy has something to do with learning. Yes. And so it may be that. So to so, so then to 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 reread it as comedic, I think misses. I mean, you can interpret it in that way if you like. No, no. I, listen, but it you, may. But but I think you're missing the point. No, I think. Listen, I have just spent a lot of time. To, I, you may be right. Uh, tragedy and comedy may be may prove to be inept ways to think about this. For example, I've realized... No, I didn't say that. I, didn't. I know, but I've realized that, for example, fiction and nonfiction don't work in the visual arts. They work in writing, but there's no such thing as a fictional painting or a non-fictional painting. There may be a realist painting and a non-realist painting, but there's not a fictional painting and a non-fictional painting. But you told us your proposition is to make it up. I know. That's but, fiction. But eat, no, no, no. No, making it up is not fiction. Making it up in writing is fiction. Making it up in painting is no more because there's no such thing as not making no it up in painting. Well, I mean, in a certain sense, when you do architecture, you always make it that's up. That's right. So that means so that we need. So there is no need, other possibility. That's right. The, the point is if so you we do it. So architecture is already a making it up. So it's going to be something like it may be realist or non realist, but it will never be real. And it will never be non fiction. You know, I, this probably has not a hell of a lot to do with anything, but I remember talking to you years ago, and you, there, there, was a, uh, there was a book which was a collection of essays, I think about the Wexner, and with the sort of usual characters writing the usual stuff about weak form and whatever that is. And, and you wrote... Um, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you quoted Ho Chi Minh yeah, no. <laughs> and Stalin, and I called you up, and I remember reading this, and I called you up, and he, uh, you son of a bitch never said that. Yeah, And, yeah, and right. the answer was a perfect answer, which is something like, well, he should have. Yeah, that's right. You know? <laughs> and, and, and I think as an operational principle, uh, but, 
but that's a little different <laughs> than making something and letting everybody cruise around in a picaresque way, unless you're saying to everybody, now you go in and make up your own story. Well, th but, th I, you know, one thing is I'm much closer to shows than, I mean, you're much closer to architecture. Like, I love, I have a hysterical, exaggerated love of art exhibitions for precisely for their ephemerality precisely for the fact that people don't pay very close attention to them. They spend very little time in them. If you have an opening, if you go to an opera, can you imagine having an opening of an opera in which there's food and drink and you're doing that in the middle of the performance? So, it, but in a, if you go to an art opening, there's everything in the world there to distract you from coming. For one thing, everybody's there at the same time so you can't see anything, plus there's food and drink to make sure you leave the thing. You're there for five minutes. But it's enough. The art exhibitions or art and architecture shows gain their power primarily from their tentativeness. And I really love that. I love the... Who's, so I don't, who's your constituency? Uh, to whom are you talking when you say this? I mean, is it this Sherry, audience? Sherry, I want are my you, job back. That's mostly... You're it. fired. <laughs> <laughs> Fire him again. Um, no, I mean, in, in other words, are you your own subject? I hope or not. No, I, I mean, I, I hope I... You know that work? Thomas, Thomas Wolfe piece that the only thing I can really do is tell you about myself? Yeah, what well, I mean, isn't, isn't that, that what you? we all through? Yeah. yeah. Isn't that true so everybody? it's really about, I don't know, I'm not speaking for everybody. But I would I mean, like to, I always imagine I'm uh, addressing myself to an audience. Not speaking to an audience, but addressing my work to an audience. So you're the subject. Uh, in the sense that, I, I, how could I not be? But I, but I believe that there's stuff Well, I, can, I mean, there are a lot of ways. I mean, if you went in there like Guy Nordenson went in there right. and addressed a whole series of technical issues right. that have to do with building and what you can build and what you might be able to build and what you should build and what you shouldn't build. Right. So to, uh, to some extent, a whole series of empirical propositions that have to do with moving architecture somewhere based on the supposition that some technological advance constitutes progress in architecture. That's probably, I mean, maybe, I don't think that's about himself. I don't think so. Because uh, you, you don't have to. Maybe you want to come up. Sure. in my entire career. Sorry. <laughs> I, think, I think you missed the point. No. It's, I, it, it's, uh, you uh, completely uh. missed the point. No. This has nothing to do with a generous inclination at all. It has to do with something when you dig a little deeper and you find out that, as Nietzsche once said, even when the priest walks you across the street, it's egoism. So no, I listen, I'm not saying Jeff doesn't have an ego. The, that, the ego is like beyond the beyond. No, really, Eric, <laughs> I'm, I'm serious about this. I think it's really important. Um, I watch people make exhibitions all the time, and I watch people produce art all the time. And I think one of the things that Jeff tries to do is I'm to merge sure. the two in a really remarkable way. And I'm not his defendant. I did kind of fire him. But, no kind of you know. about it. <laughs> not only that. Well, and maybe you want to rehire him. Four me, times me. refused to rehire despite all my begging. Let's come see the show. I just, uh, huh? Yeah, one, I, I have one other question. I just didn't want to leave anybody with the impression that this is virtue if you're selfless and, and uh, malice if you're selfish. It's not that kind of discussion. It has to do with what motivates certain kinds of work. And if it comes out of something which is internal or introverted, as opposed to if it comes out of something which is external and extroverted, 
Those are different kinds of responses, and that's what we're talking about. I just I wanted to do this thing with the uh, last point, which has to do with the sky. Huh? <laughs> because, because you wrote about this, this uh, uh, Antaeus, who was um, one of the strongest characters around, uh, who was apparently the son of Poseidon and had a fight with Hercules, huh? That's one of the 12 layers. And, and right, and, and Hercules was about to lose yeah. and got him up in the air. Yeah, yeah. And the point, the point was if you're up in the air and you lose your contact with the ground and it weakens Antaeus and he was finished and Her Hercules won the fight, which is by way of, of validating the premise that, that what's important architecturally originates on the ground and is connected, connected to the ground. And, and I, I found, uh, I, was, I was looking around for this this morning, um, another uh, highly qualified expert called Ovid. <laughs> and, and when, I guess, uh, Daedalus made the labyrinth and uh, Minos, for whom he made it, was, was apprehensive that Daedalus would give the secret away. And then, and then the Minotaur would get out or people would get in and so on. And Daedalus was contemplating how he might get out of town. And the quote was, Minos will block the land and the sea, but the sky is open and by that way will I go. And so if we're going back to, to early aspirations, the sky is certainly one. And in my sense is it's not so much stick it to the ground or hang it from the sky, but it's the tension between the two, one reaching for the Always other. Always was, it? yeah. Okay. But, now can <laughs> I say one, I'll just give you my response to that. When I grew up, uh, and, and if you listen to Mike Cadwell lecture, you'll hear sky and ground. When I started to read architecture, sky and ground, sky and ground, how a building meets the sky, how a building meets the ground. And it was true, and you could read every building in terms of that. And all of a sudden, it started to seem that the sky started to disappear. And, it, and I started to think that happened for two reasons. One is, it became easier and easier and easier to build taller and taller and taller. And the effect of building taller and taller and taller got less and less interesting. Less and less interesting. But also, we started going to the moon, started leaving the solar system. So architectural relationship to the sky started to fade in, uh, profoundly. Now, it, now, there are ways that we can terminate the verticality of a building. So I think, for example, John Haydick's hair taught us to teach how to actually end a vertical thing profoundly there. So to put, to, like the hair on your head no longer invokes the sky. So the top of a building is very important. But, but what you're saying is it, it may be a question of how to do it, not that the well, aspiration that is an antique. Well, that's the point. Now, well, let me just close by thanking some people. I want to thank all the people from Ohio State. I want to thank you absolutely, enormously for inviting me to do this. It was a really fantastic thing, and I love you dearly for doing this. <laughs> but. You should know something. One of the reasons I asked, besides the fact that uh, I'm totally incompetent and Steve really gets stuff done and I think he's a fantastic architect, is that he is a absolutely committed, card-carrying, will never change his mind, believes deeply in his heart and thinks everyone else should believe that tragedy is it. You know, and that art, tragedy is architecture's, you know, that's it. And I wrote the Antaeus thing just for him. <laughs> so, so you just made it up again. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of my stuff. You know, it, it reminds me, I think when, when I did that piece in there and we had the discussion, yeah, yeah. And, and you came up to me and you said, either you needn't have done this at all or you shouldn't do this. Yeah. Which I still was, that. Which is, and the meaning of that applies to you? Yeah, yeah of course. And the meaning is? Uh, you shouldn't or needn't have done that because all it could do. When you say you, you mean us? You, no, you. But that was, because there are two different reasons. Okay. No, no. Um, 
You needn't or shouldn't have done that because all it could do was undermine your mystique as director. All, in other words, it couldn't improve anything for you. All it could do is hurt you. Um, so having learned that, you know, but I don't think it did hurt you, but I mean, why bother putting yourself in a gallery of a school you're the director of? All you're doing is inviting um, diminishment. But this is a kind of Sun Tzu of architecture yeah. advice, so, and, and, which is not the subject of your essay. I mean, this is no, a no. tactical. Which is why I decided to go in there as the absolute best at what I do. And then, by the way, do the other thing I do incredibly well, and that is throw extravagance beyond compare in order to uh, compensate for the fact that I shouldn't have been in there in the first place. <laughs> Anybody else want to uh, <laughs> offer any uh, additions or corrections? Nope. Wait a nope. minute. Nope. No. Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> oh, okay. I wanted to ask a question about the architectural list. I don't think I should do it now, but I was asked to deliver this. Okay. So, here. Oh, thank you. That's, That's a, not a question. From thank Osuma you. bin Laden? <laughs> it's ticking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> take it over there. <laughs> Anybody else? Comments? Quite? Yeah. Yes. I'm interested in this quadriptych that you have behind you. You have um, some avant-garde notion of the future in Italy a long time ago, the UK a long time ago, some late capitalist reference, and then you have some sort of avant-garde, which is your work, and... Not oh, my work, it's his work. <laughs> well, you've now dismissed everything. What do you have to offer? Well, I'm wondering... Um, Didn't sound like you have anything to wonder about. <laughs> Hold on a second. What are you wondering? <laughs> wondering. I have, I have two rhetorical questions, you followed by an actual question. If, I'll I'll is you your it. work futuristic? Is your work ancient? How does your avant-garde practice negotiate those two extremes? Okay, uh, I'm only interested in the now. So, are you asking me or are you asking Eric? You answer, I don't know. Um, so, uh, the now is constructed by fantasies of the past and the future. So it's impossible not to be both of those things but only a person who believes in reality and realism <laughs> actually. <laughs> hey, you got one. No, I don't want one. <laughs> Ten bucks a piece. You know, if you go out in the corner of Wilshire and Alvarado and put pencils in this thing, you'll probably do pretty well tonight. All right, I Anybody will answer else? all other questions accurately in private. Anybody else? Thank you very much. Thank you.